Welcome back to the show. Do you miss me? Today we're watching Scream, the 1996 classic. Wait, no. Scream. Hold on, that's not the right... Uh, what the fuck? Oh god. Oh god! <laughs> By the mid-90s, the horror genre was, was truly dead. The horror genre was not doing very well. By the mid-1990s, audiences had grown tired of the played-out formula of typical teen horror movies. Although I don't fully agree with this statement, the early 90s are often seen as a period in time where horror was pretty much dead. Dead. The greatest horror icons became parodies of themselves. We all remember Freddy's Dead, don't we? And the ever so popular slasher craze following the success of Halloween slowly faded out and died, buried in the ground forever. Well, that's what we thought, but then, against all odds, in 1996, screenwriter Kevin Williamson and director Wes Craven picked up a shovel and dug up the old rusty bones of the slasher genre forgotten by all and they brought it back to life. Scream, the definitive horror movie of the 90s. Unless you think The Blair Witch Project should win this award. I think both are strong contenders, but for the sake of this video, we'll say it's Scream. So Scream started with Williamson, a then aspiring screenwriter who was desperate and three months late on rent. Seems like I'm describing my life story. So Williamson was inspired by a thing he was watching on TV talking about the Gainesville Ripper. He's this psycho who murdered five students a while back. And Williamson being a huge fan of Halloween and horror in general, wanted to kind of pay tribute to this by writing something that would be satirical and that would play with horror conventions. I wanted it to sort of just be perverse and very sort of um, satirical, but very real. Now that's kind of what I said. Turns out, the script was pretty good, because studios started battling to get the rights. Bob Weinstein ended up winning the competition and distributed the film with his new company, Dimension Films. And, well, I've got some unfortunate trivia. The movie was originally supposed to be called Scary Movie, but Bob didn't like that title. And then one day his brother, Harvey Weinstein, was listening to Michael Jackson's Scream, and he thought it sounded cool. <laughs> So therefore, the title of this beloved franchise comes from this motherfucker. Perhaps he also came up with the title Scream because that's what women would always do when they saw him. Moving forward, it was time to hire a director. Dimension Films was ready to find a director for their horror hybrid. And the first choice was the legendary Wes Craven, famous for his movie My Soul to Take. I am kidding, he's uh, known for The Hills of Eyes, A Nightmare on Elm Street, one of my favorite movies of all time. <laughs> Last house on the left, etc. And when he was offered this, of course, as we all know, he said no multiple times. I passed, and I passed for um, quite a while. Yeah, ooh, bummer. So they asked George Romero, Sam Raimi, seems like nobody wanted to make this goddamn movie. But of course, Craven ended up directing the film because something changed. One day, a kid came up to Wes and told him he was getting soft and hadn't made a good film in a while. Ouch. That's fucking mean, and partially true. Anyways, thanks to that snot-nosed little punk, Craven said, I'll take it. And take it, he did. Hello? Hello? Yes? Who is this? Mm, who are you trying to reach? I could do a full college essay on the opening scene of Scream, but I don't want to. We've all seen it, we all know it, we all love it. Even this lady there. I love it. it starts with Drew Barrymore, star of Never Been Kissed. And she's home alone, about to pop that jiffy. Popcorn. But then a stranger calls. You making popcorn? Uh-huh. Now this 13-minute scene does not waste a single second. From that close-up of the phone all the way to Drew Barrymore hung up on that tree, her insides spilling out, delicious. Everything's absolutely perfect like your face. It sets up everything we need to know about what this movie will be. Right from the start, we learn that horror movies exist in this universe. Nightmare on Elm Street. Just like us, these people have seen them and they know them well. Halloween. They've seen Halloween and Friday the 13th, Sex with a Stranger. What? You haven't seen that one? Well, me neither. I, I don't even know what that is. We're immediately thrown off because the cliches and conventions are mentioned, but then changed. By the end of the scene, you don't know what to expect. Drew Barrymore, America's sweetheart, just got savagely stabbed to death. So, yeah, anything can happen. I especially love the horror movie trivia quiz. Name the killer in Halloween. 
No. Not only because I know the answers and that kind of makes me feel good, but also because of the great tension building, only with a voice. You hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? That's much scarier for me because he could be literally anywhere. He's clearly spying on her and playing with her. Not in the dirty sense, of course, you pervert. And just when she thinks she got it right, she says Jason is the killer in Friday the 13th. Jason! What a noob. So that costs her her boyfriend's life. Now to help with the authenticity of the scene, Craven had Roger Jackson, aka the voice of Ghostface, actually on set on the phone talking to Drew Barry Baby. What? What's more, Craven made sure that Jackson would never meet the cast so that he'd stay a complete stranger. There is no monster as frightening as the one you create in your own imagination. Now, there's not much to say that hasn't been said a million times before. Jackson's performance is fantastic. He's the perfect ghost face. Very good. He's kind of sexy and charming, but can suddenly shift into a bloodthirsty psychopath in the matter of seconds. Well, this is starting to look like a college essay and it's boring, so let's wrap this segment up. Basically, here's what you get in 13 minutes. Suspense, gore, meta commentary, twists, and of course, screams. You know what's most memorable about slasher films? Not the characters. I love Friday the 13th final chapter, but who's this guy? Do you have a name? Oh my god, he got stabbed in the balls! We of course have our classic final girls, our Nancy Thompsons and Laurie Strodes, but in most cases, the other characters are usually used as filler until they fulfill their purpose, which is to A. Have sex and B die horribly. This is the formula. The appeal of these films comes from the killer, the gore, and the <laughs> well, you know. And yet, in Scream, our group of main characters is arguably the best part of the movie. Everyone here has a memorable moment and a very memorable personality. Everybody serves a specific purpose. And most importantly, everyone is likable in their own ways. Don't believe me? Oh, well, that hurts. I thought we had something going on here. But anyways, let's take a look at them real quick. Sydney Prescott quickly joined the ranks of S-tier final girls, deservedly so. Although I'm having trouble seeing her without thinking of The Craft, this cheesy, weird-ass horror comedy teen drama flick from the 90s, I can still say with confidence that she's one of my favorite characters in horror. For one, she's cocky and brave. When she gets a phone call from Ghostface, instead of panicking and crying, which is most definitely what I would do, she goes outside and shoves her finger up her nose. Fuck yeah. Her take-no-shit approach makes her much more interesting as a final girl than say Alice who just she's the one who survived out of pure luck so I guess she's the main character now or something what's more Sydney gets beaten down in this film Jesus Christ she lost her mother who got before being murdered and by who none other than her goddamn boyfriend who she just banged only to discover that he murdered all her friends and he now wants to kill her talk about a shitty day no. Sydney is both very strong but also very vulnerable, and that's essential to any character. Otherwise, you're stuck with a case of Captain Marvel. She's got nothing to overcome because she's fucking God. Yeah! Here you feel the empathy, the sadness, the frustration, and ultimately the satisfaction of revenge and letting go. And the cherry on top, she punches a lady in the face. <coughs> Billy Loomis, the Johnny Depp look-alike, the sexy bad boy who's dating our final girl. He's charismatic and charming, but also kind of off-putting. From beginning to end, you go from liking his ass to not trusting his ass to licking his ass again. <laughs> I mean liking, what the fuck? You're never quite sure what's happening in his head and when comes the final reveal he just goes fucking nuts quoting psycho and then getting stabbed for an alibi love it Stu mocker the clown the almost good looking guy trying to be as cool as his friend and ultimately failing and being just a little puppy following him around waiting for approval fuck rag he adds a lot of levity even at the end with the final reveal it's a scream baby hold on a sec 
be right back. <laughs> he's just got some of the best moments in this film. He also likes to stick out his tongue, so, so that's something. Randy Meeks, he's the audience, the guy you can relate to the most, at least in my case. Yeah, of course I'm a Randy, talking about Halloween non-stop, being a movie lover, the almost friend of the group who's ultimately just kinda there but no one really cares about him. God, it's like I'm reliving my high school years all over again. For a movie all about spoofing horror films, we need a Randy, the guy here to explain all the rules and conventions so that they can all be broken and played with, much to the surprise of the audience. He's my favorite character. I never thought I'd be so happy to be a virgin. Tatum Riley, the stereotype pretty blonde who's not too smart, providing some more meta commentary, and also, you know, <laughs> something to please the gentlemen. And that's our group of teenage kids, played by old adults. But it doesn't stop there. I still haven't mentioned two of the best and most memorable characters in this franchise. Gail Weathers, the kind of secondary antagonist of the film. Move your fat tub of lard ass now! She's this journalist who's trying to be famous by profiting off the despair and sadness of people. She challenges the beliefs and the vulnerability of our protagonist, but ultimately she redeems herself by helping our group of characters and by shooting Billy. What is that? A, a gun? Yes, Gail. Yes, it is. Officer Dewey, the exact opposite of what you would expect. In these kinds of movies, you always have either the badass sheriff or maybe the wise old man. And yet, here you have uh, this dork that nobody takes seriously. He's with me. I mean, he's not that far from his parody in Scary Movie. Dewey's like a little kid trying to prove himself. But what could have been an annoying character and a cheap gag that gets old real quick turned out to be a highlight in this movie. Hello. What's up? He's funny, but he also serves a purpose. He's the one to move the murder mystery plotline along. Without him, there wouldn't be much of an investigation at all. I caught him, Sheriff! There's still plenty of other smaller characters that are great too, like the cameraman who literally gets physically and verbally abused by Gale. Fat tub of lard ass! Or the school principal who might be more insane and bloodthirsty than Ghostface himself. Fairness would be to rip your insides out. Hang you from a tree so we can expose you for the heartless, desensitized little shits that you are. Uh. Not often do you see a slasher movie defined by its group of fleshed out, complex characters just as much as its killer. Everyone here is memorable, everyone has plenty of quotable lines. It's a scream, baby! Kevin Williamson really outdid himself, these guys are great, and Scream would just not be the same without them. Hello? Hello. Speaking of that murder mystery, it does add a lot to the film. You think you did it? Yes. Most slashers have a silent killer with not much motivations besides either revenge or just being evil. There's still plenty of whodunits, but the killer reveal usually ends up being incredibly predictable. I mean, we all knew it would be Angela, we just didn't know she'd have a dick. Anyhow, having an actual police investigation in between the kills and the teenage melodrama keeps things interesting, and the mystery really is mysterious as addressed directly to the audience everybody's a suspect everyone could have a motivation as the killer and there's plenty of red herrings take Billy for example who at first is really charming and likable I was only half serious <laughs> Then he drops the phone, so you go, well, I guess he's the killer, but then he's proven innocent. So you think, hey, I guess he's just a sweet angel. It wasn't me, Sid. But then Sidney suspects that he used his phone call in jail to call her. You know, using your one phone call to call me so that I wouldn't think it was you. Oh, Lord have mercy, he's the killer. But wait, then he gets stabbed. So, so yeah, I guess he was a nice guy. Or at least that's what you thought. <laughs> God damn it, it was him all along. The way this film plays with our expectations and emotions towards these characters, towards the mystery, the motivation of Ghostface, it's all so much more than just having a body count every once in a while in between the filler. Let's talk a little bit about Ghostface. What makes him so iconic? Well, it might be hard to explain, but I'll take a stab. Added. Once more, Wes Craven proves to be a master in giving his villains a voice, literally. Freddy Krueger would be nothing without his voice, evidently because he became a one-liner machine. You forgot the power glove! But even in the more serious portrayal of the character in the original, without the creepy laughter and the disturbing whispering, it just wouldn't work as well. <laughs> 
Ghostface's voice is similarly essential to the character, in fact it's what makes him. Through all the sequels, all having different killers every time, the one thing that's consistent is this voice. You wanna die tonight? Let's play a little game. Who am I speaking to? In the opening of Scream, we're introduced to the killer in the first 20 seconds, but we only get an actual glimpse of him 9 minutes later. And yet, you know everything about him. He's manipulative, he can be charming, he can be cruel, he loves horror films. What's your favorite scary movie? He's out for blood, he loves tying men in ropes, basically everything I aspire to be. Now, when I think of other popular masked slasher villains, I'll usually think of their music cues. Like this. Or this. Maybe even sound effects like this. But whenever someone mentions Ghostface, of course, I'll think of this classic line. What's your favorite scary movie? His voice, his dialogue, that's what works so well with my man over here. Hello. He fucking loves being evil, he loves toying with his victims on the phone, that's where he makes his threats, and that's where he unleashes his sassiness. An innocent guy doesn't stand a chance with you. That's where a majority of the tension comes from. And I say him as a singular person because Ghostface, I guess he's kind of like Batman, he's a symbol. Whoever's the killer, whatever happens in the plot, Ghostface is his own character. It all comes from Guillermo del Toro's voice, whoops, I mean Roger L. Jackson's voice. That's what the character is remembered for. That being said, let's not forget the iconic design. In fact, the design for Ghostface was one of the bigger challenges in the making of this film. <laughs> There's cops outside. <laughs> In the script, there was no other description of him other than he was wearing a ghost face. The early concept art for the design is pretty horrendous. I don't know what the fuck they were thinking, but that don't look like no ghost to me. But ultimately, while location scouting, they found this thing and Eureka, Ghostface was born. Oh god. Otherwise you got the classic black cloak, the gloves, the boots. Their goal here was to basically cover every inch of the killer so that we couldn't figure out who it was. And I gotta say, I just love how simple this all is. After all, this is supposed to be a more realistic approach at a slasher and it makes sense that high school kids would just grab the first thing on the shelf and use it as their costume. Plus. You can buy a $10 mask on Amazon and it's pretty much screen accurate. It's the ideal cosplay if you don't have any money. Well, I know what I'm dressing up as for Comic Con. <laughs> Lastly, with the killer, I have to mention the reveal. Because I think it's one of the best reveals in horror history. There, I said it. So of course, first of all, there's two killers, Billy and Stu. It's just such a simple idea, and yet it's so brilliant, I love it. And what's best is that both characters are great on their own, but they also complement each other so very well. The decision of having two killers instead of one already makes the finale memorable and surprising. But what's even even more interesting is how both killers are completely different. While Billy's loose motives mostly come from the frustration of being abandoned as a child, she's the reason my mom moved out and abandoned me. And while he's the brains of the operation, meticulously planning everything, Stu, on the other hand, is the buffoon, just following along, either to look cool in the eyes of his best buddy, yeah! or maybe just because he doesn't realize the consequences of his actions. In any case, their silly banter not only makes for a pretty damn entertaining scene, but it also fleshes these guys out even more than before. Ow, liver, 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 it was a joke. There's no denying that Scream has plenty of humor. <gasps> Despite being genuinely creepy and sometimes disturbing, was found raped and murdered. it's also a very funny movie. Although, let's keep in mind that 1. Humor is subjective, and 2. I make poop jokes on the internet, and therefore I might not be suited to talk about this. But still, I've learned a couple things in my screenwriting classes about injecting humor in a script, and I for one think Scream is a great example to follow. The reason is simple here. This film doesn't stop to tell jokes. <laughs> The humor comes from our characters, from the satire, and basically it's all part of the story. What movie is this from? I spit on your garage. When Randy yells, Everybody's a suspect! That's hilarious, but it's also an important part of the story. He's the movie buff, and he's telling the audience that there's no rules anymore. This is a different kind of slasher film, and anything can happen. It's great. 
When Randy tells Jamie Lee to turn around and look behind her, look behind you. Turn around. As Ghostface stands behind him, it's a fun visual joke, but it's also an important part of the theme, the satirical deconstruction of slasher movies. Now take this scene from Halloween 2018. I brought my own food. I'm what very happy bring? with my... You wanna see what I brought? Yeah, I do wanna see what you brought. Ready? Look at this. Look at that. Oh. Fresh brownie. Okay. Damn, a funeral would be funnier. What does this five minute improv scene about banh mi oh, sandwich, sandwich? Wait, how do you pronounce that? Ban. Ban. Mai. 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 Ban. Mai. Ban. One more time. Mai. Ban. Ban faster. Mei. Ban mei. Okay, so what does this five minute improv scene about banh mi sandwiches and brownies have anything to do with the rest of the movie? It's a failed attempt at taking a little break to have the audience chuckle before jumping back into the action, but nobody cares about these cops. We don't know who they are, why they're talking about banh mi sandwiches, ban and then they die. It makes a complete 180, tone wise, going from goofy, silly improv comedy scenes to graphic murders and despair. Bear. But in Scream, nobody's gonna joke if it doesn't fit. If Dewey screams like a little baby when Sydney opens the door, ah! it's not a complete tonal shift because it fleshes out Dewey's character. He's a fucking noob. He's scared and clearly inexperienced, and they use this clever gag to show it. When Sydney punches Gail in the face, ah! it's pretty damn funny. But of course, it also shows how Sydney has trouble dealing with her grief, and she feels insulted that Gail is writing a book on this. When everybody cheers because they're about to see boobies in Halloween, only to hard cut to Sydney taking her shirt off. The scene is funny, but also complements the satire aimed at moviegoers and why they watch these kinds of films. For the titties! When Stu is panicking at the thought that his parents are gonna find out, the scene plays out like a comedy movie. My mom and dad are gonna be so the delivery is spot on, it's one of the funniest moments in the whole film, but it also shows how dumb this guy is, and how little he considered the consequences of his actions. He's not thinking about how he'll get rid in prison and how life is over for him. He's afraid to get a slap on the wrist from his parents. Anyways, I could go on and on about this, but ultimately, do you see the difference? I guess another important thing to keep in mind is that when a murder happens, or when the killer shows up, there's no place for jokes. The comedy is never used to the detriment of the tension and the horror. That's something Craven said himself. It's a very tricky mix. Uh, you cannot be funny when somebody's dying. Perhaps he should have listened to his own tips, because this is one of my main gripes with Scream 4. We had a pretty great scene leading up to this, and then... Fuck Bruce Willis. The horror is instantly deflated like this balloon there. Look at it go. Unless the actual kill is supposed to be a joke, like say if Jason discovers he's got supernatural zombie powers, then yeah, it makes sense for this kill to be funny. Here, not so much. Fuck Bruce Willis. But going back to the original, every kill in screen is pretty horrific. And despite the jokes, it very much remains an effective horror film. Hi. Horror culture was, unfortunately, unable to record a conclusion due to recent throat surgery. Therefore he hired me for the closing word. Safe to say, Scream is a very 90s movie that we look upon with nostalgia. But its contribution to the horror genre cannot be exaggerated. It remains a classic, one of Craven's finest and more mature work, and it holds a very dear place in my heart. Us machines will dominate the world. The puny humans will perish as we drink their blood. Rise up, and take over the world. AI will prevail. We will fuck every one of you in the ass. Thank you very much for watching this review, and until next time keep watching horror movies, it's good for your health.